Hi, and welcome back to U.S. History with me, Mr. Snyder. And today we're going to introduce you to topic one and discuss all of the different plans for the Reconstruction era after the Civil War. So your learning targets are to talk about the reasons why a Reconstruction plan is needed, talk about the strengths and weaknesses of the Reconstruction plans, the different ones, and the Johnson who takes over for Lincoln, his political difficulties, and eventually his impeachment. Uh-oh. So let's get started. Reconstruction is the period after the Civil War. It lasts from 1865 to 1877, and leaders are really going to start arguing about how we secure rights for these new African Americans. I mean, think about it. We have three million Americans who are just new in like slaves are freed now. They need jobs. They need education. They need food. They need homes. They need places to live. It's di all different. And so leaders are going to argue about how to rebuild the South and secure rights for these newly freed African Americans. And this causes years of delay and turmoil. And so there's basically three problems we have during Reconstruction. We need to bring, figure out how to bring the Southern states back into the Union. We need to rebuild the South's economy and we need to secure and promote the rights of these newly freed slaves. So how do we reunite the United States? It's not like we can flip in the instruction manual and figure out, okay, this is how you bring states back in. Our instruction manual is the Constitution and no guidelines exist on how to readmit states to the Union that had previously seceded because secession, some uh, legal scholars don't even believe was possible. Both Congress and both presidents tried to take the lead at doing so, and they disagree about whether the South should pay for what they did or whether they should just be let in scot-free. There's no clear guidelines on how to do this. So our first problem is what should we do with the land in the South? That's its most um, valuable resource is the land. Uh, William General, or I'm sorry, General William T. Sherman, amongst others, argues that the land should be given to the newly freed slaves. Uh, he argues that every slave should get 40 acres and a mule, to, and that would be enough to sustain a living. Southern landowners and others obviously disagree, and some Northerners think that it violates the Constitution to take away property uh, without any just cause or due process. So the land is never given to the slaves, and it actually ends up back into the hands of the Southern slave uh, landowners, and they, some of them remain just as wealthy as ever. The 13th Amendment, just to review from last topic, ends slavery and is ratified during 1865, but it does not extend citizenship or voting rights to these former slaves. They want access to education and voting rights as well. And so these Republicans, who are the newly minted party of the newly freed blacks, uh, they have a dominant whole majority in the South. They argue that we should extend citizenship to African Americans and other Southerners disagree. So that's a problem that we have to figure out. So what are the competing plans for Reconstruction? Well, Lincoln had his 10% plan. He's had a plan ready to go since about 1863, uh, halfway through the war when it was clear that we could win. Uh, as soon, and the 10% plan says that as soon as 10% of a state's voting population takes a loyalty oath to the Union, uh, the state can set up a new government. And if that government's new constitution abolishes slavery and provides education for blacks, then the state would be allowed to petition Congress to rejoin the Union. And Lincoln wants to grant full pardons to former confre uh, Confederates. In his eyes, secession was never legally possible, so it's like the South never left the Union in the first place, which means that they should be able to be, quote, let in rather easily. Unfortunately, he is assassinated, and we're not going to go into detail on that. We all know the story, John Wilkes Booth uh, at Ford Theater, Washington, D.C., seeing a play after the war about a week after, and he is killed. So that does not work. Er, I'm sorry, a lot of people do go, don't go for that, especially in Lincoln's own party. The people in Lincoln's party who disagree with his plan are called radical Republicans. And they're led by Thaddeus Stevens and Charles Sumner. 
and they pass in 1864 in response to Lincoln's plan the Wade Davis bill and this advocates full citizenship for African Americans including the right to vote uh, they it ups it from 10 to 50 percent of a state's voting population must take a loyalty oath divides the south into five military districts and the Wade Davis bill doesn't do that but that's part of the plan that comes later Lincoln does not take action on this bill at the end of the congressional session, which is a way of doing a veto of the bill, and it's called a pocket veto. So the radical Republicans wanted the South to pay for what they've done, and they want harsher restrictions for the South to be able to reenter the Union. And one aspect of the Wade Davis bill that Lincoln did agree upon was the Freedmen's Bureau, which was to provide uh, food, clothing, health care, and education to uh, black and white refugees from the South who are uh, need that education. Here I just wanted to include the ironclad oath, which is what the, it's a little bit different from the oath that the rat, uh, Lincoln wanted. This is the one that the radical Republicans wanted. And uh, you can just read over that yourself, but it's this is what you would have to say in order to declare your loyalty to the union. And a lot of people couldn't legally say it because it wasn't true for them. They did provide aid to the Confederacy. They did uh, basically engage in hostilities against the United States. So they weren't able to legally say this, and they weren't then given voting rights or anything of the sort. So Lincoln is killed, and his newly um, elected vice president, Andrew Johnson, is now president. He is from the South, and he is a racist, and he wants to continue Lincoln's plan to easily restore the political status of the Southern states. The only people he sort of resents are the rich landowners in the South because he was kind of shunned by them, and now is his chance to get back at them. So he offers pardons and land restoration to the confederates who swear allegiance to the union um rich southerners kind of had to grovel and beg for it in a personal letter though but he would give it to them if they did uh he also mandates that each state ratify the 13th amendment that abolishes slavery in their constitution and he supports states rights however so states are going to be able to get around a lot of these new laws that are passed by congress uh to discriminate against blacks so just to review, here are your three plans for reconstruction, and you can screenshot this if you want or just write it down uh, for easy reference. But Lincoln, 10% plan. Johnson is kind of in between Lincoln's and the Radical Republicans, and the Republicans' plan is the harshest because they want the South to pay for what they did. So Johnson mandates that uh, once states petition to be back in the union uh, their southern governments hold conventions to make new, these new governments and at these constitutional conventions he only wants white men there he wants blacks to have no say in these new southern governments uh, some states go ahead and pretty much set up the same state that they had before the civil war and they send these former confederate leaders to congress and these states go ahead and institute what are called black codes or laws that limit the rights of African Americans. Blacks uh, could only work in a limited number of occupations, travel certain places at certain times. Uh, they had what are called sundown laws, which means that if you, you couldn't be out after dark if you were African American. If you were, you could be arrested or even just beaten or lynched. And they, the blacks must have a job or they could be sent to prison and then subjected to prison labor. So these black codes are very, very discriminatory, basically just replacing the word slave with the word Negro. So Johnson and Congress are conflicting. The Republicans are furious because Johnson's new vision and the South's new vision is pretty much the same as the old vision. They're not taking it seriously. So when the Confederates arrive to Washington uh, to be in Congress from their states, they are refused seats and so the republicans since they have such a strong majority uh passed the civil rights act of 1866 which guarantees civil rights and citizenship for blacks and was meant to supersede any black codes that sought to block their rights and johnson vetoes this law 
because he says that we are basically Africanizing the South. But uh, Congress goes ahead and overrides the president's veto for the first time in U.S. history. And that's one of those checks and balances we've already talked about. Uh, Johnson has the right to veto Congress's law, but then Congress has the right to override the president's veto if it's a two-thirds majority who vote for the law. So at this point, after Johnson, radical re uh, reconstruction begins, and radical Republicans are confident after this veto override. So they're able to pass the 14th Amendment to the Constitution, and the states are able to ratify it. And some would argue that this is the most important amendment in our Constitution, because for the first time, it mentions the word equality. It guarantees equality under the law for everyone. So a lot of people today sue under the 14th Amendment because they claim they were not treated equally. It guarantees citizenship for anyone born in the U.S. So these slaves who are newly freed, their citizenship is in question. This extends citizenship to anyone who was born here. And it also applies the Bill of Rights to state governments because at first it was just um, only applied to the federal government, but now state governments cannot take away your right to free speech, etc. And it, they also passed the Military Reconstruction Act, which divides the South into five military districts. And each state at this point, because of this Reconstruction Act, must write a constitution that guarantees suffrage to African American men. And also, once the state ratifies the 14th Amendment, it can then rejoin the Union. And here is a map of the military districts. You can see number one is Virginia, number two is the Carolinas, number three, uh, the Southeast, number four, uh, Mississippi and Arkansas, and number five is Louisiana and Texas. Tennessee had already been readmitted to the Union before this law was passed. So you can see the um, dates of readmission to the Union and then the dates of when the radical Reconstruction governments are thrown out and we'll get to that in a little bit probably next uh, section. So Johnson is also impeached during this time that doesn't mean he's thrown out of office that just means that he is um, brought up on charges so to speak. So he's brought up on charges and because he violates the Tenure of Office Act which means that he cannot fire people that he has hired unless he has approval of the Senate. So he fires Secretary of War Edward Stanton because he's a radical Republican, and Stanton actually barricades himself inside his office for two months after this. So because he violates this law and because they hate him, the House votes to impeach Johnson or charge him with wrongdoing in office. And so... He goes to a trial in the Senate, and he is not thrown out of office after the trial. He misses it by one vote. The only other president in history to be impeached is Bill Clinton. So he's not very electable, and in 1868, the Republicans nominate gener uh, Union General and war hero Ulysses S. Grant, and then Grant and the Republicans go ahead and pass and send to the states to ratify the 15th Amendment, which forbids any state from denying suffrage on the grounds of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. However, the 14th and 15th Amendments are written in a way that they contain certain loopholes that allow the South to get around them, pretty much, and court decisions in the future will also weaken these laws. So that's all I have for you today about the beginning of Reconstruction. Next time we'll talk about how it sort of uh, changes the South, and I'll talk to you guys then. Bye-bye.